Good afternoon. I'm Zachary Cashel, the founder of Marin Sonoma Impact Ventures, and it's my privilege to welcome everyone to today's MSIV Global Leaders Series, the first in a series of conversations we will host in the months and years ahead. At MSIV, we've spent the past four years building a robust startup community for Marin and Sonoma, and have primarily done so by harnessing the intellectual capital so prevalent in the North Bay and putting it to work on behalf of local startup companies and our broader startup ecosystem. Today is an important step forward for us as for the first time we deliberately turn to expertise outside of our region to harness lessons learned across the globe from leaders operating at the highest levels of international business and government and apply those lessons to the benefit of our growing local community. I could not be more excited to kick off this series by welcoming a guest that certainly needs no introduction but I will say a few words on John nonetheless. John Chambers is one of the most accomplished business and thought leaders of our generation. During his 25 plus years at Cisco, he helped grow the company from 70 million when he joined in 1991 to 1.2 billion when he became CEO in 1995 to 47 billion when he stepped down as CEO in 2015. During this time, he collaborated closely with US presidents of both parties, with prime ministers and presidents from around the world, was named one of Barron's world best CEOs and Time's 100 most influential people and received countless other honors and distinctions. Today, John leads JC2 Ventures, helping disruptive startups from around the world build and scale while also promoting the broader development of startup nations and a startup world. He invests in companies across categories and geographies that are leading market transitions, which has already included nine unicorns and six exits. Throughout his career, John has played a leading role in startup ecosystems from Silicon Valley to his native West Virginia, to the Middle East, to France, to India, and so many more. I had the privilege of working under John at Cisco for over three years earlier in my career, and so much of what I learned from his expertise and mentorship I've brought with me to the founding of MSIV. For that, I and our growing North Bay startup community owe you, John, a debt of gratitude for consistently paying it forward to the next generation. John, thank you so much for being here. Zach, it's a pleasure. Uh, with those kind words, I've got to do a good job for you, and I hope I do not let you down. <laughs> I have no doubt about that. So we'll go ahead and kick this thing off. I mean, let's just, we're here to talk about startups. So why are you so passionate about startups? I mean, when did that all start for you? Where did that come from? Well, I think it really uh, came in a major way from Cisco. Uh, at Cisco, we established a position, much like the industry did during the early 90s, that you did all your work internally and that uh, acquisitions were really not a way of growing your business and most of them failed. Uh, as you know, we rewrote those textbooks starting in 1993 and showed that acquisitions is a way to move into new market adjacencies and then to combine them with your speed of go-to-market, your service, your overall architectural play to candidly dominate a segment of the industry in each product category. So having done 180 acquisitions, and most people would say uh, still the model, uh, the gold model for what you should do and how do you do them, I found that I love doing that. And so I love growth. I love building great companies that change the world. And we did at Cisco in terms of how the world works, lives, learns, and plays. And sharing that with the employees, with our, our investors, with our customers in a way that had never been done before. Number one in customer satisfaction, a dollar invested in Cisco got you $15,000 uh, wow. in terms of return. Uh, we had 10,000 millionaires that we created among our employees uh, in the 1990s. I love that. But what I really love is growing and scaling organizations. And I think most job creation in the future will come from startups and small companies getting big because of AI and other productivity tools in the market. Uh, you're probably not going to see incremental headcount put into the global Fortune 500, if you will, as we know it today which means that if you're really going to have job creation, if you're really going to have standard living increase, more and more of it will have to come from startups. So in simple terms, I love it. I love to compete to fault, Zach, as you know. I love to build organizations, and uh, I try to drive very hard to uh, play it forward in terms of what others have given me. Yeah, that certainly resonates a lot with what we've been talking about here in the North Bay, with startups being the future, startups being the engine for future job creation here mm -hmm. in the community. 
you're now a professional investor and partner to startups. So when you're looking at these companies that, and you're thinking about with a mind toward we're building that future, what characteristics do you look for in these founders? And are there qualities that you feel are often overlooked or how do you sort through all these different ideas and people that want to build the future? So about four questions. Uh, part of what I do that is, is allowed me to be successful, but also handle the setbacks. And you know, I've seen every movie, Zach. I've, I've messed it up at least one time uh, on it. And uh, so I learned from my mistakes as well. And if you're not making mistakes, you're not taking enough risk. But what I've found works for me very much as a leader is having a playbook that I use again and again and constantly reinvent and have the courage to change when it's appropriate. So my playbook for Canley startup selection was almost identical to my playbook for acquisitions. Uh, the first thing I look at is a business model change that is occurring, such as in the old world, uh, the ability to uh, sell stuff online, which Amazon clearly got. And it was enabled by the internet. So you look at a business model change enabled by a new technology. You're seeing that in a major way in customer right. service with AI and many other categories. The second thing I look for is a CEO. And while we always want to believe that we're all equal in life, the CEOs who are successful, they're, they're a special breed. Uh, you watch for the CEO that she or he is able to show a vision, a strategy, uh, that they are extremely highly motivated uh, to overachieve, uh, that I look for CEOs that are able to do that and have a chance to lead in their category who also want to be coached. I'm a coach much more than an investor. Uh, if you talk to the 20 CEOs, and I know you've talked to some of them, yeah. uh, they would tell you I'm their strategic partner, there for them during the good times and the tough times, but really there for to help them through, through both effectively. The third thing I look for is I go straight to customers and say, here's a company that, that I'm looking at. I either do it very directly or subtly and say, what do you really think of their product? Do they have a chance for sustainable differentiation? How do you compare them to their peers? And would you advise me uh, to invest in them? And so uh, that shortcuts a long cycle uh, that even people like Steve Jobs took seven years to develop a product. Uh, I tend to go, here's the product somebody else has developed. And then I go straight to customers who, if you give me a top Fortune 100 companies and you say, here are 10 customers, I'll know eight of them fairly well. And they'll tell me what they really think of the product uh, and the long-term differentiation. Then I try to see if they can be one or two in their product category. GE, Jack Welch taught me that one or two or don't compete. And then I look <laughs> at how close they are across the chasm, a chance to break away within their industry. And then I look at culture. That's very important to me. I didn't acquire a company that didn't have a similar culture to Cisco. Uh, and the same thing, I don't invest in companies that don't have similar values to what I believe. Well, it's a, it's a pretty comprehensive framework. I like that. Um, you know, you, you referenced AI and, and talking about the future. I mean, we're clearly in the middle of an AI moment right now. I mean, just what, what is your assessment of whether this is a hype cycle or, or for real? And, and how does this maybe compare to other market transitions that you've seen with your own eyes over the years? Well, I think it's going to be the biggest market transition ever in technology by a factor, maybe a factor of five to tenfold. Wow. Uh, more powerful than the internet and the cloud combined by multiple, it will occur at a faster speed. Zach, it was a point that literally eight years ago when I bet big time on AI, and remember, I invested in six native AI companies, majority of which are unicorns today. Uh, uh, people couldn't even spell AI. And I always say that <laughs> half tongue in cheek uh, for it. And But it, it, you could see the transition in the capabilities, first in customer service, that this technology could make a difference on. By the way, that's exactly what happened in the internet. First applications were entering orders online. And secondly, was doing customer service over the internet. So I'd seen the movie before and recognized the pattern recognition that goes with it uh, in terms of the direction. Uh, I then began to invest in what would be the early segments of that. And it was around customer service. It was around coding productivity, sales and marketing type capability. Uh, then listening to the customers, you begin to see a wave start to develop. And you begin to realize how big this productivity can be. And it's not uncommon to view that 
a 10% increase in productivity per year per company is very doable. Now, we never come close to that ever in the history of business. Yet you can probably run your customer support centers uh, as you train people with either a third of the number of people or do two, three times the volume with a much better result for your customers right. if you do this well through AI uh, in terms of implementation. It will go across all the business architecture that used to be controversial. Uh, today, uh, in a year and a half ago, before the move with Microsoft uh, on OpenAI, uh, it was still hesitant about how real this was. Once the world saw that Microsoft, with one small acquisition, even though it was very expensive and ended up being just an investment, could unseat a player like Google in a period of quarters, and Google understood it as well, suddenly the world, the light bulb went off and said, this is here and now. And then they began to see what AI can be possible of doing with tremendous opportunities. And as you know, Zach, some limitations that go with it. So when I talk around the world two years ago to board of directors or key conferences, it was still a discussion about is AI for real, how big it's going to be. Uh, any company that does not have an AI strategy and is a public company is already in trouble. And I, I think you see in the markets already reward or penalize people. Is AI going to be a disruptor to you yeah. or is it going to be tailwind for you to go forward? And the CEOs are beginning to get it. It's still in the early innings in terms of its implementation. For those of you who are investors uh, with AI, if you, 38% uh, of the investments in Q calendar year in the US were AI uh, focused. In Europe, that was only 12 uh, percent. I was shocked that it was as I thought it would be over 50. I do not invest at all in any company that's not an AI company. And I drew that line literally three years ago with forcing all my non-AI companies to become AI companies in terms of direction, all of which would tell you was a move they probably should have moved faster on in the past. So it's going to happen. Uh, and uh, uh, the CEOs now get it. Uh, if you invest in a company that has the same business model, growth, cash flow, et cetera, sure. that is a software service company or a fintech company, financial technology company, uh, the same company with a business model that is different, enabled by AI, AI has literally a 80% higher valuation. So you suddenly see the delta starting to occur at a tremendous speed where the market gets it as well. So that's, a, that's, that's why I believe it's for real and it's now. Uh, it's one that uh, there's a slight chance of being wrong here, but I, I think the market is not only recognized that's not the way it's going to occur, but it's moving with tremendous speed on it. Look at NVIDIA, the most valuable yeah. company in the world at over $3 trillion. Uh, NVIDIA is kind of, you have a doubt about how AI is doing, Remember what it was like. If you wanted to know what the internet was doing in the 90s and 2000s, look at how Cisco was doing. Right. We we're growing 65% a year. It means the internet's doing great. NVIDIA is growing even dramatically faster than that. And so if you want to know how AI is doing, just look at how, how their company's doing. Well, and I think it's a, certainly a very strong view, and I actually agree with it. But even as I agree with it, I still find it hard to tell the difference, right, between what is true innovation and what is truly going to be a lasting AI-type company uh, and something that's just dressing themselves up, you know, calling themselves AI. Because now, so it, there is a lot of uh, a lot of fluff out there right now, even in the midst of this very real transition that I'm seeing. So you're raising raising three or four questions. First is uh, everybody's going to say they're an AI company, uh, and most of them will not be, at least not with with the ability to move rapidly. So differentiating yourself as a company for what you're doing on AI that truly will move the needle for your investors and for your customers is something the companies have to get very good about. And it would shock you how even a number of very large companies are not very good at their strategy and vision for AI and what progress have you got so far and how are you going to differentiate versus all the other noise that goes into the market. Uh, and are there going to be some companies that outline a bold vision, et cetera, get funded at unbelievable levels? Right. The answer is yes. So what used to be an exception with WhatsApp? Remember what was that? Uh, uh, 2014, was it? That sure. they had an evaluation, I have to look at it, of 16 or 19 billion uh, for it. Everybody thought, 
what is Mark thinking about? He must right. have lost it. Turned <laughs> out he could have paid two or three times that. It was almost a decade later before OpenAI hit. And all of a sudden you have, and, if, and remember, WhatsApp was only 55 people. Right. Now you're talking about a OpenAI, which was several hundred people, if you will, and an evaluation of $83 billion with Microsoft paying a huge amount for a minority share on it. And so you would say, all right, John, I get it. Every 10 years, this happens. Not so. You're going to see things move remarkably fast. You've seen it recently with Mistral and France as an example sure. uh, in terms of the marketplace where for a company with almost no revenues, uh, you're really talking about a valuation of five, six, ten billion dollars. And out of the top 11 AI companies in Q1 of this year that were funded uh, by it, seven were in the US, one in France, one in India and two in China. So you now see the market moving rapidly in terms of the implementation. The cool thing is, historically, the startups who use a new technology end up dominating the field. This time, Microsoft and Google and Amazon and Facebook are going to, and Apple more recently are going to try to lead here, and they've got huge deep pockets, and they're going to bet whatever it takes to be a force here. So it's going to be really fun to watch how this plays out. Well, I, I think that's that's exactly right. Switching gears here a little bit to kind of maybe talk more broadly about startup sure. ecosystems and communities around the world. Uh, I spent a lot of time at, at Cisco learning from you and meetings with government leaders from around the world. And I always heard you talk about kind of what made Silicon Valley so special. And you, you always seem to start with the people. And, you know, I, I'd love to kind of, for our the benefit of our audience, understand you know, what portions of what Silicon Valley got right do you feel like can be replicated by other regions, specifically our North Bay region, right? I'm not a believer sure. that we can just copy what others did to be successful. I think we have to kind of figure out our own way. But but what do you think, you know, what, what would you want our community to understand about what made Silicon Valley special that, that you think could be either replicated or just borrowed uh, by any startup community that, that's serious about it? Well, there are a lot of similarities that occur between all the startup communities around the world, whether it's in Boston 128 and the prior generation of technology, Silicon Valley, looking back a decade or two, Austin, Atlanta, uh, in terms of the approach, and then hubs within it. Uh, it usually starts with great educational institutions to produce the people you're talking about. So the fact that you have a Stanford that's really good on technology, uh, et cetera, University of California. Berkeley, et cetera. You've got the education groups here that look good. Uh, you've then got to create the right environment. And that is a combination of the startup CEOs themselves, the venture capitalists who are investing in them, uh, the customers who are willing to take a risk, the supportive of local government officials, which are so important to make it easy to start a startup and uh, to scale it at a reasonably fast speed. And then you've got to have a workforce that is attracted to the area. And so it's how you differentiate on that. There are things you want to learn from Silicon Valley. There's some things you probably don't want to learn. You know, and during the 90s and 2000s, as you know, 90% of Americans felt uh, high tech was good for them and felt that startups was good for them and it would be good for the country and for them. That number now is below 50%. Some of those positions have been misused by the social media companies. And so as you think about the organizations, you want to think about, Zach, you know, and really thinking about you know, an economic benefit to your investors, uh, to your customers, et cetera, but you also owe a benefit to society. And I think those companies that do both will, will do very well in the future. As you know, at Cisco, we won every social responsibility award there was to win Middle East, uh, China, Russia, uh, across Democratic leadership in the U.S., across Republican leadership, Europe, et cetera. And wherever we were number one in customer uh, customer social responsibility, we were number one in market share. So I actually think they go hand in hand. So you want to learn from each group. Uh, I think Silicon Valley, there is no entitlement. And if you don't disrupt yourself, the market will. We're in a phase of getting disrupted in Silicon Valley. We'll see how well we regain our footing or not, but uh, there's no guarantees or entitlement. Well, I, know. I like that. I mean, so that's your experience kind of building this iconic company in Silicon Valley. You know, you've been involved for years uh, in helping build the startup nations in both France and India. So maybe 
you know, talk a little bit more about maybe what those countries are doing right in terms of fostering entrepreneurship. And we can go maybe start with France and then go to India. But I'd love okay. your perspective on why, why is that working there and, and, and how long of a, a haul has that been? And just, you know, broad perspective would be, would be great. Well, for those of you who are familiar with the European market, uh, if you go back 10 years ago, the last place you would open a, a business or put a lot of your headcount resources would be France. Uh, it was a 30-hour workweek mentality, uh, very anti-business in many ways. They had some large companies, but almost no startup engine whatsoever. And uh, UK tended to lead, followed by Germany in terms of leadership on startups. Uh, this is where leadership really matters. Uh, Alain got the idea of a digital France, and we partnered with him on Cisco in doing that, and literally announced it on the palace steps about a strategic partnership to change a country. But Macron, who was the finance minister, who I got to know very well uh, at that time, envisioned France becoming a startup nation and an innovation gateway for Europe. And I had a lot of influence on that. I think he would share with you in terms of the direction. And even my best friends back in the US said, John, you've got a mar lot of market trends, right? You're gonna be dead wrong on this one. <laughs> and you fast forward to today, and I just came back from Viva Tech less than a month ago. Uh, they now have the fastest growing rate of unicorns in Europe, in France. Uh, they, Viva Tech is the French conference that is the biggest conference in Europe by far now. Uh, on it, bringing in innovation. Uh, the uh, investments uh, by VCs and investments in the country and startups uh, grew dramatically uh, in Q1 over last year and the year before. Uh, the only other country in Europe that even grew was Italy, only by a little percent. Germany and UK were down by almost 30%. Uh, the unicorn target for France was an unbelievable stretch goal of going back seven years ago when we said it and president macron said it two unicorns at that time he said 25 by uh 2025 we passed 25 last year uh we actually have 27 uh and a lot more into the pipeline and they're recognized as the most innovative country in europe at the present time so it changed the country uh modi did it on a much larger scale i was honored to to be the French high tech ambassador when I was with Macron. Can you imagine the U.S. naming a, a German high tech ambassador or a French high tech ambassador? I don't <laughs> think so. Yet it shows how comfortable they were with disrupting and President Macron was. Modi was even quicker to grasp the whole opportunity. He built his strategy for his country around a digital France, a, I'm sorry, a digital India, and how this could change the lives of every individual in a very positive way, standard of living. And he broke it down into 11 planks from the digital India, digital manufacturing, startup India, smart cities, et cetera, within it. And he then built it how it would go throughout all 28 uh, states and drive it through. And that uh, the end result, uh, India is now the best architecture digital plan for the future. Uh, that when I had the honor to introduce uh, Prime Minister Modi in Washington, D.C. at the Kennedy Center literally a year ago, uh, at the introduction, I said they had the best plan. They'll go from number, what used to be number 10 in terms of GDP in the world to currently five. They are on the way to be three, but three is the wrong objective. They'll be number one in the world, and they will be for the following reasons. Their digital architecture, where they're going, they have the half fastest growing standard of living in the world uh, and will continue unless they mis-execute for quite a few decades. Uh, they will blow past China uh, in terms of being the number two and then I think the number one economy in the world, somewhere in the 2070 time frame, give or take 10 years on it. And they'll do it in partnership with the U.S., which makes it even more exciting. Yeah. Now, what I'm outlining is a vision of what you all talk about for your geography. Outline the goal people think is too far. How do you bring venture capital together? How do you bring startup community together? How do you attract companies to locate their startups and grow? And how do you get the local government leaders to buy into this common vision so you can change the economic benefit of that section of California in a very positive way, which I think is very doable. But you have to have the vision, then you're going to have people working together on it.
But the commonality here, it sounds like, is is leadership, is being able to build these coalitions across government, across private sector, across the investor sector. Uh, I mean, it's certainly difficult to do, but is it that simple in terms of what you go need to do? It's set the big vision, bring people together and just go and just go start building. Yes, but you've got to have leaders who really believe it, who are willing to risk their their reputations and have the courage to do to disrupt uh, on it. So leadership really matters, Zach, uh, both in what you're doing, what the peers in the room are doing, et cetera, on it. Is the playbook complex? No. Is it simple to operate? No. Right. Uh, it's so got in- a lot of variables in it. But if you do it right, uh, is that something that literally you will see many Silicon Valleys across our country and across the world? I believe so, and I hope so. Because if you haven't got a Silicon Valley mentality as a startup state, your economic future is not going to be good. Because everything will be technology. I mean, everything, not manufacturing, not healthcare, not education, not government, everything will be. And so if you don't lead in this area, uh, your opportunities for yourself and for your children and for your your community uh, is is going to be challenging. No, that's 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 super inspiring. And that's certainly what we talk a lot about here. Right. Is we are leading this startup renaissance we are kind of leading a movement to build the economic future of this community and we always talk about it in those terms because that's where you have to start we have to talk about you know are there going to be high quality jobs here for our kids to have right when they're all grown and they want to come back to the community and live and we've lacked that here so uh it certainly resonates with me in terms of setting that big vision when when you do that when you put yourself out there as a leader you know you have successes and you have failures so I know I was always impressed that you were always willing to talk about your failures as much as your successes. But you know, for the benefit of our audience, you know, yeah, I would love to to hear more about more about that. And just a a a a, a, uh, a note here before you answer that, John, uh, folks can can please start putting in additional uh, questions. We're going to kind of move to audience Q and A here in the next three to five minutes. So if you haven't already uh, put your question and go ahead. But yeah, John, uh, kind of bring it back to you on on successes and failures. Love to hear about that. Well, one of the most enjoyable thing to me when I do my podcast, and I've done about 32 of them with CEOs and government leaders around the world, uh, is are you a product of your successes or more a product of your failures or your setbacks? And uh, it is interesting to watch all their answers, but most everyone would agree at a minimum they're 50-50. And most likely it's more how do you handle your setbacks that determine your future. We all love to talk about our successes, me included, but the setbacks <laughs> that were hardest for me, I, I'm dyslexic. And uh, that's something that a surprisingly large number of people in this world have. And interestingly enough, a number of CEOs have, although most of it will not ever tell you that they are. Uh, and when you're dyslexic, you read backwards, you have a lot of trouble in areas of English and language, et cetera. And, and my parents, even though both of them were doctors, the teacher said, I'm not sure John's going to graduate from high school, much less wow. go uh, uh, on to college. And they did what any great parents do. They they told me unconditional love, told me I was smart, had me read. Your parents have no credibility with you. I read backwards and practice reading just was painful. Uh, but I had a teacher by the name of Mrs. Anderson who helped me navigate through it. And I learned how over time to compensate for the weakness. And then over time to take the weakness and actually make it a strength on how I think in terms of ABZ, which is how a lot of CEOs think. And that's how I can spot which ones are dyslexic and then ask them off the record uh, for it. And navigating through that gave me a sense of confidence that I didn't have. It also gave me a sense of humility because once people laugh at you, you never laugh at anybody else. We're all equal in life. And uh, it gave me the confidence that I can do just about anything I want in life and the balance based upon treating people well. Uh, I made a huge mistake in and uh, 2000, 2001, the dot-com bubble. And it doesn't help that everybody else made the mistake even worse. Uh, we grew for 40 quarters at an average over 65%. We had what was the equivalent of AI knowledge, but we did it okay. manually and cranked through it, knowing every order in the world within uh, three minutes, uh, knowing what the patterns were, uh, pipeline, and what it was the prior week, the prior month, the prior year. And we could do plus or minus two or 3% for the year with 80% of our business new every quarter, unheard of. 
And so I had a process that was working well and doing the right thing too long can actually get you into trouble. In 2000, the market started to drop and I'm looking at the market and I'm looking at my system, which had never failed me. And the first week in December, uh, we were going at 70%, which indicated the next quarter probably was going to be that level or more. I'd level set the market you know, and things were unusual. Maybe 40% growth should be fine for the next quarter. I reaffirmed it. Uh, we'd never had a quarter below 50% growth. So I thought I was being extremely conservative yeah. uh, on it. Middle of January, minus 45%. Minus wow. 45%. 25% of my customers didn't stop ordering. They went bankrupt, disappeared in a matter of months. And uh, I had to lay off 7,854 people. These were all people I hired. Zach, as you know, I get very close to my team. Uh, we are a family culture. Some people disagree with that. It was very powerful for us. Our attrition rate ran 5% voluntary for the 20 years I was running the company on it in an industry that averages 15 to 20. Uh, but I missed it. And uh, I kept doing the right thing too long. Uh, and I once I saw those numbers start to come in in early January, I spent 10 days traveling around the world, came back and decided to make the decision and to move one time very aggressively. Got the stock, got hammered. We went for the most valuable company in the world to, to people questioning, should I be running the company? Uh, and the questions were fair. You know, we we missed a window and it doesn't help to see your peers miss it. And it doesn't even help today to say that we handled it better than anybody else. And we came back even stronger. But I think you're a product of your setbacks more than you are your successes. If you're going to take risk in life uh, and you don't have setbacks, you didn't take risk uh, on it. And you've got to have a personality and a financial understanding of what the risk taking you're capable or want to do. I think that's very well said, and thank you for for sharing both of those. I mean, it's incredibly inspiring to understand kind of, you know, how you persevere through all these things throughout your career. And to your point, if you're not able to get up after the setbacks, like you're not going to be able to succeed in in much of anything. It's almost a, as yeah. Go ahead. I actually like startups that have members of the team that have gotten knocked down and gotten back up. Yeah. And I'll tell you, out of my startups, nine unicorns, which is unheard of for only twenty investments. I mean, unheard of. And we've had six exits in the last two years, which is also unheard of. We have two of the top three in all of the venture capital world with Ben Sando and with OpenGov, which occurred uh, uh, earlier this year and uh, earlier the following year in front of it at $1.9 billion and $1.8 billion. But every one of them has had a near-death experience. And at first I thought, what am I doing wrong? And then I realized <laughs> it's just more of a a nature of the beast that we're in now that's moving so fast. So it isn't, are you not going to have those challenges for the startups in the room or the venture capitalists in the room you're going to? Now, as a venture capitalist or as an LP, I'd spread my bets. Uh, out of my 20 that I bet on, two of them that I thought were going to be best actually stumbled pretty bad. Uh, some of them that I wasn't sure about ended up being great. And they go up and down. It's no straight up into the right market. That's, that's, I've gotten this advice from lots of investors. Don't be overconfident on which which part of your portfolio is going to be your winners. And, and the ones that you think are, are struggling or, or muddling, you know, they it just oftentimes takes them longer to figure it out. So just staying humble throughout that journey. I think but you is, know what is different with AI to give you numbers that will yeah. probably make your group uncomfortable. It used to take five years for a startup uh, that was really good, headed toward a unicorn status. Uh, it took two years to develop the product. Then the third year, you needed to get somewhere between five and eight uh, key customers in. A run rate of about uh, uh, a million ARR uh, on it. And then it took you about two more years to get up to run rate of five million. That was what my ideal model would be for a unicorn of the future. Today, we develop the products with AI in three months, sometimes as quickly as one month. We bring it to market in the next quarter, and we are at a million dollar run rate, sometimes in a month, sometimes in three months. Uh, we then entered a five million run rate in 18 months. Wow. So what does that say? Speed of change. Yeah. And that is enabled by AI and the implementation of it. So this is a new world that's going to move with the speed of disruption for good and for bad, including job loss. 
uh, that we haven't seen before. And thinking through it as society, I think, is one of the big challenges we face. Well, I think that's a good segue. We have some great uh, questions that have been put into the chat here by participants. The first is from uh, Federico Baradello, CEO of Finalis, one of MSIV's portfolio companies. You know, John, Cisco's strategic approach to acquisitions has clearly been a significant driver of its growth. However, a number of studies indicate that 70 to 90 percent of M&A transactions fail to realize their promised value. And I know at Cisco, we were always so proud that you know we were the exception to that rule on so many respects. Um, from your experience, what differentiates successful M&As from those that fail? And how do you see AI playing a role in improving the success rates of acquisitions? OK. Uh, three questions. So in terms of the overall approach, when we did our first acquisition, which was a company of Crescendo before I moved, I, I've studied very carefully in the market how M&A had worked in the industry. And I knew coming out of IBM, it had worked terrible. And the best thing you wanted as a company was for your competitors to combine. Uh, and so uh, when I started in, we weren't going to be smarter or work harder. We we're going to have to do it different or we wouldn't succeed. So the first thing that I did is focused on golden rules for M&A. Number one golden rule, uh, it's got to be really strategic to you and it's got to be a game changer. If it's a nice to do, if it is something you're already doing, it's just going to help you a little bit. You're not going to have the fortitude to stay with it. Secondly, as odd as it sounds, in high tech, you don't combine companies with different culture. And it doesn't mean my culture was right or wrong at Cisco. You knew what it was, customer first and everything we do. Just do the right thing in terms of uh, focus uh, and act, you know, an approach of innovation. But if you can't do it internally, we're going to acquire to get there. Uh, and uh, those type of things are fundamental to the companies we acquired. And it doesn't mean it's right. A Netflix have a different culture than, than an Oracle. Or Oracle had a different culture than Cisco. All those companies were successful. The third thing we did is we went straight to customers to say, is this a company I ought to be acquiring? How strategic is it to you? And they told us, in fact, I'd say two thirds of the acquisitions we did, probably more than that even, were I could tell you almost which customer recommended that we acquire them uh, in terms of the direction. A Ford and a Boeing, for example, on our first acquisition of uh, Crescendo uh, in terms of the direction. Uh, then we look at, how we can outline the products to work together. We make all the changes day one. We don't surprise them with multiple shoes and changes on it. And uh, a a gut check that Jack, if it isn't if it isn't really worth tremendous upside, uh, you're more likely to achieve the downside. We just run that playbook again and again. I used to do geographic proximity, and you're wondering. Why did I drop that off the list? <laughs> now with Zoom and this type of technology, we can go global quicker and the workforce is used to it. So geographic proximity to your headquarters or where you have major centers used to be a key factor in it being successful or not. One of my most successful companies, Unifor, uh, has done five acquisitions already in their young history. All five of them are outside the US. Yeah. All five of them so far are working well. So it's getting that playbook down, uh, having the courage to change when you need to change. Well, I love that. Um, Will the failure question. rate still be very high? Oh, yes. Will it be above 70%? Oh, yes. Will there be spectacular train wrecks? Oh, yes. Uh, and as an investor, you want to understand how the companies you're investing in are going to do that differently. Or as a startup, you've got to say, what are you going to do differently your peers? That's not going to be your smarter. And don't fall into the trap of, I can get them to change their personality. I know they they aren't company oriented, uh, teamwork oriented, but boy, they can score a lot of points. Yeah. I'll get them in. I'll teach them that. So you can't we, change personalities. We have six minutes left in the broadcast. So I have one quick question from another participant. And then I, I want to reserve the last one for, for myself because I have an important okay. question to ask you. Uh, this one's from John Mallon, an MSIV executive network member. John, given the fast pace of new technology and change happening, how do we make sure that too many people in society are not left behind and that the income wealth gap doesn't continue to widen dramatically to a point that it hurts our society? Um, well, going in the order you question. said, one of the things we have to do is we've got to get startups across the majority of the country. Uh, if the startups are only in six states, six cities in six states or so, the majority of the wealth is going to be built up around those locations. And we're already seeing that occur in both big metropolitan areas in the north and northeast, as well as, as uh, some of the southeast getting left behind in terms of the market. 
The second thing is to realize it is going to happen rapidly and how do you get ahead of it? And so, you know, and my parents, both doctors, deal with the world the way it is, not the way you wish it was. This is going to happen. So it's how do you adjust? And I think we've got to do a better job in our K through 12, but especially in the universities, of training people for entrepreneurism and the disruption that occurs and preparing them for where the jobs will be in the future, not the past. As companies, I think we owe an obligation to train our employees about AI. Not talking about it doesn't do any good. Yeah. The French Postal Service in France, in theory, one of the slowest moving government agencies in the world in a country that does not traditionally move fast, they have 65 startups working with the company. They've acquired multiple AI companies. Out of 280,000 employees, they trained 250,000 of them. They know that mail delivery is going to go from 18 billion pieces of mail in a given time period to three. They know if they don't move into new areas, they get left behind. So they're already moving into packaging, already moving into pharmaceuticals, already moving into uh, you know, DoorDash type of applications with a very trusted brand. And they've trained, like I said, 250,000 of their employees. And now they're training them additionally uh, in terms of certification with an AI. So that is an example of what I think we have to do more as a country, get ahead of this one. Our companies have to say it's going to come. How do we retrain our workforce? Because that's in their economic benefit if they retrain their workforce as well and just move them up the value added ladder as AI does a lot of our basic job functions. Your competition is not AI. Your competition is your peer or a company peer who does AI. That's well said. Um, we have three minutes left here, so I want to bring it back to our North Bay community. But Don, look, here in the North Bay, we've had a very challenging last seven years across a pandemic, devastating fires, a mega drought that has now thankfully come to an end. And historically, as I think you know, right, the local economy in the North Bay has been highly reliant on wine, tourism, and agribusiness. And MSIV has been pushing this idea that we must, as a community, make investments into diversified sectors that are much more insulated from the ravages of climate change and that build our future as a community, hence us leaning in so heavily to boost the local startup sector and kickstart this local job creation renaissance. I mean, drawing on all these experiences we talked about across Cisco, across you know, India, France, across what you're building throughout the world, you know, what, is, what advice do you wanna leave us with as we get to the end of this broadcast? Um, you know, what should we be thinking about as we push ahead here to make sure this is successful? Well, the first piece of advice is a, is a fun one. You've got a dream. And I worry as a nation, we're not dreaming enough. We're accepting what is coming our way as opposed to saying, I'm going to have the courage to change it. With the technology, you can change it with tremendous speed. It doesn't take decades and decades to make fundamental changes. Uh, You've got to have people that will come together from the VC world, from the startup community, from the education community, from government who share that vision. And you've got to have a couple of leaders who really make it happen. And before the people in the room say, yeah, we can do this, but in incrementalism, incrementalism doesn't work. You have to have the courage to cross that chasm, chasm and you've got to move with speed. If I were to draw a parallel, we've talked about France and India. Let me talk about my home state of West Virginia. Yeah. We were the chemical center of the world when I was growing up uh, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, we had 6,000 of the top chemical engineers uh, in Charleston, West Virginia, like Silicon Valley did. Uh, we had more millionaires in the state than the United Kingdom combined did. We were the coal mining, mining center of the world, 250,000 high-paid uh, coal miners. Yet, because we didn't reinvent ourselves, say too dependent upon a segment of the industry that could disappear and actually did disappear, we went from being in the top in most categories to number 45 to 50 in almost all categories. We outlined a vision seven years ago after talking at West Virginia University that we could change this. And then we outlined a vision that we were going to get state government leaders, national government leaders, our business community, our universities to change the curriculum. We're going to go with a startup community, much like Stanford modeled or Polytechnique in France modeled uh, in the university. We're going to change the curriculum entirely to focus much more on big data and cybersecurity and AI and entrepreneurship across the whole school. We're going to attract companies to the state as far as being a destination for their future growth and direction. And normally, if you do that, you in a period of uh, every 10 years get a $1 billion big bet on your state. We've gotten six 
individual billion dollar bets in our states in two and a half years. Wow. We've got 65 startups in the Vantage Venture Program in West Virginia University. Uh, we uh, have had one of the fastest growing economies and uh, uh, also standard living in the country. And we're for the first time beginning to hold our young people in the state and attract new people from outside the state. So a lot of successes, complete agreement of Republicans and Democrats working together <laughs> on this. And uh, the far right or middle or the left comes together on the same vision in terms of the approach. It's led in part by our leaders in the government, including both the Democratic and Republican national senators, Shirley Moore Capito and Joe Manchin, but also Governor Justice, and will be led by whoever follows Governor Justice in that. Uh, the university leads at West Virginia University, Gordon Gee uh, leads. We all came together with this vision, but it was impossible. Nobody believed it could be done, yet we've done it well. Now, are we over the, the uh, chasm? Yes. But could we fall back? Absolutely. And so if we don't continue to get outside our comfort zone and disrupt, we'll get left behind. So my last thought for your group, have yes. the courage to dream, but realize you either disrupt or you get left behind and you've got to regularly reinvent yourself. Well, thank you, John, for that. Uh, there's only one path for us and there's only one option for us, which is to disrupt and to move forward and to build the future of this community. And uh, I can't thank you enough for uh, the wisdom, the in the inspiration, but also just spending time with us. Uh, it's really a treasure to have you as part of, you know, this community's formation as we think through all these great ideas from all over the world and how they can be invested into Sonoma and Marin County. So thank you so much for being here. Zach, it was my pleasure. I hope I didn't disappoint and I hope people, I made them a little bit uncomfortable, but also got us dreaming bigger together. Thank you, John. Thank you for everything. And thank you all for participating as part of our Global Leader Series. Uh, we hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Cheers and thank you.